everyone. Welcome back to the, uh, well, the penultimate session of, of the meeting. Um, first speaker is uh, Ben Rosis. Uh, he'll talk about very detailed uh, thermal studies of asteroids uh, in the context of Osiris Rex, I guess. So uh, that'll hand it over to Ben. Thank you for the introduction. I hope people aren't too sleepy after lunch. So I'm not actually going to speak to you about super rotating asteroids like 950DA, but luckily Jürgen already touched on that instead. So instead, I'm going to focus this talk on how thermal infrared observations and physical modeling can play a supporting role in asteroid support return missions. And particularly with my involvement of the Osiris Rex mission through the, the science team analysis working group. Uh, I spent um, last year working with Josh Murray at the University of Tennessee, and I'm now back in the UK at the European University. So to give an overview, of what I'm about, I'll give an introduction to the Osiris Rex mission and its target asteroid Bennu, and then I'll discuss why we may want spatially resolved thermal measurements to aid in the sampling process, and the model implementations we've constructed for the, the mission, and there are two models, the ATPM and the FTPM, I'll go into detail of that. And I'll go over the, the model testing just to see whether we can meet the requirements for the mission, and then I'll summarize by other considerations we might have neglected in our, in our preparation work, and I'll summarize at the end. So a brief introduction to the Osiris Rex mission. So it's the third selected mission of the, the New Frontiers program, and it will study and return a sample of the asteroid venue. It will launch in 2016, rendezvous in 2018, and return a sample in 2023. And there are five main mission objectives, which are to return and analyze a, pristine, a sample of pristine carbonaceous asteroid, uh, to you know, map the global properties, chemistry, and mineralogy of primitive carbonaceous asteroids, document the texture, morphology, geochemistry, and spectral properties of, of the sampling site to put the return sample in context of its um, sampling environment. Number four, measure the Yarkovsky effect and constrain the computing properties. And finally, Characterize the disk integrated global properties to, to allow direct comparison with ground based telescopic data. So, as a brief summary of the thermophysical properties of what we currently know about Bennu, um, as I said, it's a carbonation B type asteroid with a 42 meter diameter. And this is uh, some radar observations and a radar shape model. As, as you can see, it's got the characteristic four-point shape of um, the binary asteroids. But interestingly, at present, it doesn't have um, a secondary companion. Either it's um, lost its child already, or it hasn't given birth yet. We'll probably find out when we get there. <laughs> um, it is a very dark asteroid with a bond albedo of about 1.7%. Uh, it has a rotation period of about 4.3 hours. And it has a measured thermal inertia of 310 plus or minus 70 SI units, which Josh Emery was using Spitzer observations. And in this plot, um, it suggests that there is some surface heterogeneity in the thermal inertia based on model inferred uh, thermal, based on the variability of thermal inertia uh, determined by the modeling as a function of rotation phase. So there may be a rotation of variability in the same on the mission that we can see from distinctly related observations. However, it could be caused by a variation in surface rock instead. And this is quite typical of ground-based observations that there is typically a degeneracy between thermal inertia and surface roughness. Um, um, in addition to the thermal inertia, we also know the bulk density to be slightly greater than one gram per cubic centimeter. And this was inferred by the a Yarkovsky drip measurement, which I'll describe later as well. Um, based on the bulk density and comparing it to the, the grain density of an associated meteorite like with a B-type asteroid, it indicates a porosity of about 40%, indicating that you know, it is likely to be a rubble pile asteroid, which is consistent with its York-Pulse shape. 
So board Osiris Rex, there's the Osiris Rex for emission spectrometer um, uh, called OTES, and uh, collect film from the data from 6 to 50 microns. And it will be used to derive temperature and spectral emissivity um, across the asteroid surface at relatively high spatial resolution. Um, as I mentioned previously, as part of the team, there is the Model Analysis Work Group, or TORG for short, which will be responsible for determining the, the disk integrated global sample site film inertia of Bennu, um, which will aid in, in determining the appropriate sampling size. And we will also have a thermal model for the temperature predictions um, that will be used by um, the engineers for spacecraft operations and to test, and finally to test theory of the autosity effect. So how to um, measuring thermal inertia at spatial resolved scale help us with um, inside, uh, some site identification. So if you consider a, like a, a large scale of, uh, uh, photograph of an asteroid, um, like you can instantly see regions that are rough and bothers where you may want to, where you don't want to send a spacecraft because either it's going to be very hazardous to touch down on the surface or it's going to be too solid to actually return a sample. You then see smooth regions that kind of like smooth at this spatial resolution, but if you take a closer look, um, you find that this region may contain a boulderous um, surface at the small spatial cell, but this one has a nice smooth surface, and this will be the one appropriate for sampling. Um, you could probably uh, you can distinguish between these two types of surfaces without actually looking at them up close, as you can use the the, the thermal inertia, which we've been talking about this week, and as thermal inertia is a measure. Um, it kind of uses, you can use it to infer the presence or absence of loose material on a planetary surface. And you basically have um, low thermal inertia for dusty surfaces and high thermal inertia for rocky surfaces. And so, going back to this um, <coughs> picture, you'll see that the top surface would have higher thermal inertia than the lower surface, um, than the, the smoother surface. And so, you could probably have chosen this one. Insight just based on its thermal drift value alone. So, um, in addition to the, uh, the mission operations and measuring the, the thermal uh, spatial scale, is also interesting for asteroid science. And um, particularly for me, I'm interested in the asteroid geology and redolith distribution across the asteroid surface. So, if we um, Look at a tower, and you plot the gravitational potential as shown in the left, left graphic here. You can see that the, the fine grains of red reflect in the, the low gravitational potential, and you have the boulders um, collected at the high gravitational potential. So, on the, the shape model, the period and the density we currently know for, you know, we see that the low gravitational potential is around the, the equator. And you might expect, uh, therefore, to find a low thermal inertia around the news crater with higher thermal inertia near its poles. And this would be something interesting to investigate. Um, so the thermal also drives on the Yarkovsky effect. This was briefly touched upon on the first day by Alexei. So um, the rotating asteroids with thermal inertia have afternoon size warmer than the morning size, which leaves, causes a uh, uh, photon recoil force to push the asteroid to orbit. And it will either cause the asteroid to orbit, orbit to expand or shrink, depending on whether it's a prograde or retrograde rotator. And Mu has a very known orbit, and the autopsy effect was measured and found that the, you know, the, the orbital semi-major axis of being was shrinking at a rate of 284 plus or minus 1.5 meters per year. So we measured the Yarkovsky effect at less than 1% precision, which is quite remarkable. Um, and so we then can use the measured Yarkovsky drift and a thermophysical model to basically measure the density of the asteroid as a thermal inertia, which is plotted here. 
and we see that it's highly dependent on the thermal inertia. But as some people may not know, it also depends on the surface roughness, and surface roughness tends to enhance the Yarkovsky effect. So in this case, we've got a large uncertainty from the thermal inertia and a large uncertainty from the surface roughness contributing to the, uh, the bulk density determination. So in this case, we actually have model uncertainty greater than the measurement uncertainty. So part of the mission will be trying to constrain the contributing properties to the Yartovsky effect. This is um, how the Ozzy Rex mission will work, um, broken down into its various mission stages. Um, so as I said, it will launch in 2016, the rendezvous in 2018, and we'll begin a period of about maybe 300 to 400 days of just characterizing the asteroid before we try to uh, sample it. And we have the return in 2023. So there are basically two phases of the characterization stage that we're interested in for the, for the talk, and that's the, the detailed survey start, beginning at the start of 2019, where the Cyrus will hover at seven different observing stations. Um, and these seven observing stations will observe Bennu at seven different times a day to try and map out the diurnal temperature curve of different elements. And at this distance, the, the spot size of the O-test instrument will be about 40 meters. Um, and so we'll spend about 55 days uh, doing this characterization. Um, once that's finished, uh, and based on the data collected, like 12 sampling of pulse sampling sites will be identified, and these will characterize them in more detail during low flyby during the reconnaissance phase, where we'll then have temperature measurements at about five to eight meter spatial resolution. And from that, we'll I think they're down to like, is it three more three sampling sites or um, after a just one, okay. So, as you can see, it's quite a busy, um, tight schedule, and so our analysis has to be done quite quickly. So, the spacecraft engineers they gave us um, constraints on our temperature predictions. So they want to know the asteroid temperature to within 10 Kelvin. Uh, and this actually constraints on what we need to know the thermal inertia. And we find that just by comparing um, neighboring thermal inertia and the temperature difference between that to fit within the 10 Kelvin, we need to know the thermal inertia to within 20% of the true value or whatever the, the effective thermal inertia value is at the, at the surface spot. And we need to be able to do this, to be able to drive the thermal inertia higher plausible range from very dusty uh, low thermal inertia surfaces to very high rocky thermal inertia surfaces. And the model needs to be fast and accurate to fit in with the, the tight mission schedule. So we considered two approaches to the problem. Um, they um, referred to as ATPM and FDPM. So ATPM um, stands for the advanced physical model and the FDPM is the, the fast thermophysical model. Just a distinction between the two. So they both come with pros and cons. So the the ATP is a full approach. It includes global weathering and self-heating effects, which will be important at the terminator of the asteroid. In theory, it should produce smaller uncertainties in our derived values. The disadvantage is that it, um, it really, the shape model is a thermal modeling, so we can't really do any prior work until we know the shape model from the, the images and it's slightly so these things are running on a, a single workstation we're not using a cluster so the FTPM the fast thermophysical model it's basically a lookup table approach where we don't need to know the, the shape model before modeling and will be much faster than the ATPM but the comes with disadvantages that neglects the shattering and self heaters that are incorporated into the ATPM and would therefore produce lot of uncertainties. So to go into more detail with the two different models, so ATPM was a um, model I developed during my PhD and have been continuing to 
that up. Um, just like, um, so this model is based on like um, advancing thermophysical model. In particular, like previous thermophysical models focused on just one application. Either they interpreted thermal infrared observations or did Yakov yeah, effect. So I thought I'd create a combined model that can do both, uh, which is where the ATPM came from. The, the ATPM includes uh, 1D heat conduction, global shadowing, global self heating, and rough surface thermal infrared mean effects. And in particular, I have treatment of heat conduction within the surface of craters because we'll be interested on the the night site temperature, which the large loss approximation doesn't work for. And it also allows you to accurately compute the, the Yarkovsky and your effect in the presence of surface roughness, which the large loss approximation doesn't quite do a good job as. And the model is described in these papers and some example applications are in these. And uh, Jürgen explained the applications of 950DA earlier. So this is just a a quick diagram of how the ATPM works. We can see it includes the, the direct sunlight, the scattered sunlight, uh, real thermal radiation, and conductive heat, and the thermal radiation loss of space. And this is a typical surface boundary condition that will be solved. What's not included in this diagram is that for each kind of facet shape model, it includes the, the sub facet surface mass, um, which is supplied by the, the hemispherical craters. but the, the, so the facets within the hemisphere are created to match each other, but they also act with the, the global shape facets as well. So you've got two levels of complexity hidden in there. But, um, but due to the way of how heat is exchanged in the model, it can be uh, uh, relatively slow. So to try and uh, maybe, maybe not be quick enough for the to fit with the time mission operations therefore. So we thought of a way to speed it up. And this idea came from some of the Mars guys on within the uh, thermal analysis working group, which have their KRC model for Mars and this. Um, so the KRC model is basically a spherical TPM. They run a model for different latitude bands. Uh, Traditionally, you thought a spherical TPM can't really be applied to a regular shape body, but we thought of a way to map a spherical TPM to a regular shape body. And this was actually described in the Zeta talks yesterday. So basically, if you consider the surface normal of a facet of a regular shape body, the normal be split into a latitude tilt angle and a time tilt angle. So the latitude tilt can be mapped to a, a specific latitude on the sphere of TPM, and the time tilt angle can be mapped to a specific time offset on the time on the sphere of TPM. And the potential of this is that you can end the a vast speed in the, the physical model. Um, so if you run, okay, if you run a sphere of TPM for 180 latitude bands, then and you want to apply uh, a 2000 shape model, for example, you get a 13 times speed up. But obviously, you will be in the microscopic shape and in self heating effects, which may not be suitable for the site specific temperature maps. And this is basically demonstrated in this plot, basically comparing the ATPM versus the FTPM. Um, for a relatively flat surface with a bit of flat local topography, then there's uh, not much difference between the two models. But if you consider a hilly local topography, then you see the self heating and shadowing effects come into play. The differences between the model can exceed the top in accuracy limit. So to test uh, the knowledge, we really had to have some test data, but as far as Rex hasn't got there yet, and so we need to create a fake data set. We created a fake asteroid with a randomly distributed film inertia chosen from the measured pressure that Josh got from Spitzer, added a randomly distributed roughness map. From that, we created some example um, test data at the, the seven different observing stations. Um, these are brightness temperatures arrived at 11 microns. And we've 
try to simulate Otis instrument certainty by adding a certain degree of Gaussian level noise to the observations. And as you can see, we have two observations on the, the side. So we can, this shows how we fit the data. So you can see we've, we've got the data and the fit, and this is for one randomly chosen facet. And this randomly chosen facet is a thermal inertia of 361. And we can see map, partially mapped out the ANL temperature curve. And when we fit the model to the fake data, we derive a thermal inertia of 360 plus 20 uh, minus 10 SI units. So we get um, good agree between the model and the input thermal inertia got, which is good. Um, this plot basically shows the relative performance between the FTPM and the ATPM. As you can see, the FTPM um, has much larger bars, but we still get pretty much the one-to-one -one trend being our the input thermal inertia of our fake asteroid to derive thermal inertia from the model. And the ATPM is much more accurate as expected. And we can derive the thermal inertia, whether we are a roughness map or not, from the sources like from LIDAR. Uh, basically shows the thermal inertia residuals. Uh, as you can see, we're not quite getting to the the, the poles of the asteroid. And um, this is because the um, uh, the pole obliquity of Bainu is very close to perpendicular to its orbital plane, so we're not quite seeing the diurnal temperature curves at the pole. But importantly, we achieve 20% accuracy required for the 10 Kelvin temperature predictions. Um, as a surprise, we were actually able to derive the thermal, uh, the surface roughness um, from the, these seven observations in addition to thermal inertia. So roughness fraction is basically the fractional coverage of the hemispherical craters. And FTPM overestimates them slightly, but FTPM pretty much, there's a nice one-to-one -one relationship there. And then we can then use the the derived thermal inertia to predict uh, temperatures at different mission places for which we don't have OTS temperature data, and the, the predictions are within the required. So these are one sigma uncertainties, and we can see at three sigma, we're still within the 10 Kelvin uh, prediction required. And then we can also predict the, the temperature at different depths, but this is given in skin uh, thermal skin depth which would need to be converted to like a, a more physical unit by making assumptions on the, the thermal conductivity and heat capacity. So situations that we may not have thought of including the model is temperature dependent properties and Marco showed this on the on the first talk of this session. And um, as you can see the there is some div divergence between temperature constant and temperature dependent prop, which are important close to the terminator on the night side, which we are not currently taking into account. We're not currently taking into account multiple layers or volatile sublimation. I expect we may encounter something we haven't thought of at all, because uh, nobody's really taken day here on at this kind of special scale. But I have, we have to caution that we may end with uh, too much model complexity that we have too many free parameters and data points to constrain them. Um, ideally, we would like to test with real data before <laughs> actually getting to a main because um, the asteroids are probably not ideal like mathematical models. So maybe we should use um, similar data take for other planetary bodies, in particular, I think the yellow divine data set of the moon would be a good starting point. Um, in particular, after seeing the, phase, um, the rotation phase coverage of the diamond phase, uh, the temperature curves they got, it seems suitable. We have to pick the seven um, local times from their data set, see if we derive the, the same thermal inertia as those guys when they're using the full data set. There are other possible data sources to try. So to briefly summarize, um, the Cyrus Rex will provide unprecedented thermal data on the Earth asteroid in addition to 
higher boost of 2 when it gets to 99 on JU3, and it probably hear more of that stuff. Um, thermal inertia and predicted temperature play a role in choosing wind sites. A fast and accurate thermal model is required to fit in with the tight spacecraft operation schedule, and we implement two approaches between the ATM and FTPM. However, we should be prepared to handle the unexpected. I quite like the image of the um, service by Vesta, uh, by Dawn, and we can see it's these high albedo spots, which must have thermal properties, which if anybody's got any ideas about that, we'd be interested to hear. So, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> um, I know this, uh, this fast and accurate models that you have to do for spacecraft operations, as I said yesterday. Uh, interesting here for me, but I didn't quite understand the FTPM. Is it the, the one that uses the mapping from the spherical model towards effective attitude and... Uh, yeah, that's right. The, the yeah. Time. I just called it FTPM just to distinguish it from the other one. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, so that, that's a fast one, but it, it neglects self uh, shadowing and, and self healing, right? Yeah. It be important for. So, for the, to, to include shadowing and self healing, you have to run the ATPM? Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's if we find um, if the object is highly irregular, like um, it's yeah. a tower. So. Okay, thanks. So, mm. yeah, we decided to go with a quick and dirty answer with the, the FTPM. Mm -hmm. And then wait a few more hours later, and then we get a more precise answer with the, with the ATPM. Okay. Are there any, any predictions of the magnitude of the orb, the orb effect, and can be detected during the mission? They do plan to constraints on the orb effect, and that's actually Another working group is focusing on that. I think it's the, the, the shape popping working group is very, and they were, um, I think the the current shape model is actually predicted to spin, but it's quite a crude shape model at the moment. And as it's spherical, um, well, it's a sphere, so the, it's a relatively weak one. So it'd be sensitive to the shape uncertainty and also the tangential Europe effect. Hey Ben, uh, I was a bit surprised by your statement that ATPM needs shape information, that but the FTPM doesn't. I mean, your FTPM must make some assumption on the shape, and your ATPM could just do the same. Okay, yeah, it? I missed out uh, that point. So with the FTPM, we build up a, a lookup table, um, so we can do all the thermal modeling before we get to the app, and then if we get the shape model, we can just read out the lookup table. But obviously, with the ATPM, you can't build up a lookup table before you get there. So you have to run the full model once you, you once you've got the shape model. Okay, thanks. You, you must have said it, but I just missed it. What what's the range of spatial resolution that OTS will get? So we'll get the for the global survey. The spatial resolution will be about forty meters, and uh, about a 500 size body, so we end up maybe about so we have maybe 2,000 resolved surface elements across the surface, and then for the 12 landings, uh, 12 candidate sampling sites, we'll go down to maybe five or eight meters per pixel. Awesome. Um, what's what's the obliquity of Bennu? Oh, it's like minus 88.8, something like that. <laughs> it's pretty close to being perpendicular. <laughs> okay. So there should be some permanent shadow then. Yeah, if there's some um, craters at the top. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that almost concludes the questions. While we're changing speaker, I have just a quick one. Uh, it just follows on from your point on your, uh, and I guess the gentleman commented the back on how much of the surface is going to be seen. So uh, how much of the surface will be mapped? This is a question for the, anyone else on the team. During, all of it, I think. It, it, all yeah, of it's going yeah. to get. I mean, and how good will it be to mo be able to model your because I, I would imagine that's another priority leading up to the thing is to is to measure your. Would that you be? want to answer this one? Mm -hmm. So the mission yeah. requirement is to map at least eighty percent of the surface. Okay. At least eighty percent. 
Um, and especially for those for those detailed survey maps, where at stations that are kind of equatorial, so it's kind of hard to see the poles. That, that state those stations were with 40 spatial resolution. But there are other um, mission phases where we're in basically a polar orbit, and we've requested to have um, thermal observations during those orbits as well. So we'll get the pole. So I think for thermal, we'll get we'll get the whole um, pole surface. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and um, there's a laser altimeter, actually a couple laser altimeters, um, and we'll have, the, I mean, those obviously operate um, on night night side as well, and we'll have um, the shape model will cover the entire the entire globe. Okay, uh, we're almost ready for the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Tatsuaki Okada, and he will talk about thermal infrared experiments in Hayabusa 2. Hi, I'm Tatsuaki Okada. I'm happy to be here to talk about the uh, experiment and discuss with you. So, my talk is um, basically a reduction of uh, Hayabusa 2 mission and uh, experiment. Um, the, our team is basically Japanese from Japanese, but uh, some European members, uh, especially for the Thomas Brown, uh, invited me to sh come here today. So, the talk here is uh, uh, first uh, uh, outline the Hayabusa mission, former Hayabusa mission, and uh, next uh, the outline of Hayabusa 2. And after that, uh, experiment using the star imager in the objectives and instrumentation and some calculation. So the Avista is a seven-year round mission to the asteroid Itokawa. So it's launched in 2003 and arrived 2005. And the three months observation and touchdown operation for some correction and come back to the Earth. Uh, actually, Hayabusa images the Itokawa uh, so it's a very interesting body. It's a uh, uh, probably a rubber pile object, and uh, there are some uh, places that have rough trains and some uh, uh, flat trains. And the flat trains is not uh, uh, fine regress covered with fine regress, but uh, uh, pebbles, centimeter size pebbles. And so uh, we have many things to learn from the observation of the Hayabusa mission by remote sensing. And after that, uh, and now the Hayabusa sample analysis is ongoing. Actually, there's a very, very tiny amount of samples, but it is very important output. And every year we have a, a, a simple gym to discuss of the latest report of the mission, uh, mission and uh, uh, sample analysis reports. So, come here. so they have two. In the second asteroid mission, the Hayabusa, former Hayabusa is uh, strictly speaking, it is the first attempt for us to the uh, deep space mission in Japan. So it is the engineering mission, but the Hayabusa 2 is not only the engineering, but uh, also the uh, science missions. So, the, the purpose is the, so the scientific and engineering objectives it has, and the target actually is uh, the 1999 J3. It is a bit larger than Itokawa, and uh, uh, it is the, uh, the shape is uh, rounded, so it is very difficult to determine the pole axis. So currently we have no known uh, pole axis. <laughs> but uh, a rated report, the pole is uh, rather declined and retrograde. And the summary energy is uh, estimated about 20, 250 or something like that. So it is a uh, Estimate uh, considered as the, not the Faragris surface, but uh, 
uh, pebbles or something like that. So Hayabusa 2 Sprout is basically the same as the Hayabusa 1 design, and uh, it has uh, uh, some instruments uh, for the observation, remote instrument. Of the, one of them is the thermal infrared imager to measure surface temperature map or thermal emission mapping. And some other important thermal experiment is the mascot lander. It has a, a radiometer to the size on the surface. This is, it is by the European countries. This is the size of the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. It is a rather small. Uh, this is the list of the scientific instruments on board. The two, the one is the large and imager and the wide angle imager. Uh, this is used for the navigation and the near infrared spectrometer covering three microband. Not long, sorry, to the, the longest length is 3.2, but uh, uh, covering the three microband. In the summer, infrared, I told uh, in detail more in detail, and the laser altimeter, and the sampling device, and the small camera impactor, and the deployable camera for the uh, impact experiment on asteroid, and a small rover and lander, and radio science. This is the overview of the schedule of the Hyperset mission. Uh, it was just lost last December, and uh, now in the uh, uh, on the cruise to the asteroid. The next December, uh, the asteroid by to change the orbit to arrive the asteroid in 2018, and about one and a half year uh, stay in the asteroid and the remote sensing observation and. Uh, and divide the lower lander and try uh, three times for the touchdown for sample correction. And uh, another one is the impact experiment. And return in 2020 after the, the sun resist starts. Uh, this is the movie. Oh. So this is a time mark to measure the uh, horizontal direction uh, relative to the surface. And the touchdown and the sample using projectile emptied the surface and detected material is cast. Before the start at uh, down, the, this is the impactor. It's very dangerous for spacecraft. So spacecraft escape and behind of the Asteroid, and after that, the impactor eject the tire, the surface of the asteroid, and uh, excavate. And a small detector, detachable, uh, small satellite view the impact experiment, so the ejector, impact ejector will be imaged. After that, spacecraft will uh, touch the and correct the sample of the jet excavated material. This movie collects the ins uh, from inside of the crater. Actually, it is very dangerous for spacecraft. So the, probably the spacecraft will collect near the crater, just outside of the crater. So that's the experiment of in Hyperset 2. The uh, 
both for scientific mission uh, purposes, just like the Osiris Rex. The scientific mission is the, of course, the uh, some physical properties of asteroids. The, and the mission purpose is the, the sample site selection and the uh, 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 safe landing assessment because uh, space is very uh, dangerous, hazardous, and uh, uh, summary, uh, very severe condition sometimes. So the objective is something like the, uh, what is the scientific objective is the uh, nature of the uh, surface uh, composition as a uh, surface rock or build up porosity or particle size and sedimentation conditions and geologic features. Or well, that's the environment, so the EOP or the Yakovsky effect information. And uh, from the summer history, it is uh, very important. Uh, it, this is our uh, grad student uh, laboratory experiment show the, uh, the very different and uh, thermal conductivity uh, due to the uh, porosity. So it is very important to know the surface material porosity by the, uh, some uh, remote sensing method. And uh, for uh, compositional work in HIVA2, the near infrared spectrometry will do this with material, but uh, it is uh, it's very important to know the some component for rejection, but uh, it has only the uh, wavelength range is very narrow, uh, up to 3.2 microns. So the TIR data is used to reject the thermal component. And the other one is the uh, 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 verification of grand list observation uh, for the uh, model of the the relationship of the uh, thermal energy and the asteroid size or with like you know, the highest temperature experiment uh, calculation uh, because have the two the target of the has to is the seacrest and the organic material is uh, very important to important so the uh, one of the important points for the sampling is a uh, sampling site determination for the mission objective is uh, one of the uh, important point is the uh, to reach the hazardous uh, point uh, from the uh, high from the high altitude seems like a flat surface but uh, actually is uh, very in case then there is sometimes a very hard surface. So if the thermal inertia is so large, it is the dangerous hazardous point. So it should be rejected. And uh, for some fiction, the millimeter size material is enough for the analysis of the sample analysis paper. But uh, uh, larger than one centimeter size particle is difficult to collect for our uh, sampling device. So it should be choose depth of the limited size regular area. That's the one of the important point. So the instrumentation of the TIR imager. This is a single band uh, imager. This is basically the commercial based thermography. So it is the uh, with is the uh, eight to two micron single band and they use the uh, uncurved barometer arrays about uh, 328 times 248 pixels. And the uh, view is a larger, large, large wide field of view, 16 by 12 degrees. So the uh, uh, the resolution is uh, 0 0.05 degree per pixel. So, um, actually, 
for the carbonaceous material, we uh, consider as the uh, wavelengths uh, actually the emissivity has a wavelength, uh, uh, wavelength dependency, but uh, basically it is the other first attempt. As the first assumption, uh, we uh, choose the uh, constant value uh, because the laboratory experiment for the carbon material it is a very uh, 0 0.5 or something like that uh, during 8 to 12 micron range. So this is some example of the experiment in the laboratory and uh, integration test if launch. So it's uh, very good. And after launch, the, we observe the deep sky and uh, it's the uh, condition it's uh, we confirm the uh, conditions very good. Uh, the, actually, the same designed instrument is from on the Akats Venus Climate Orbiter in Japan. And uh, actually, it has observed the Earth just uh, launch in 2010. And uh, Venus atmosphere uh, during the uh, flyby of Venus. So. It works very good, very well. So the now we now we confirm the temperature range of the TIR is from 150 about 150 to 440 degree Kelvin. So the very wide range temperature can be detected with uh, uh, the uh, good resolution. And uh, point source can be uh, detected in a single pixel, 0 0.05 degree per pixel. So it is a uh, uh, quite uh, good special resolution. So, and the synergy experiment with surface experiment experiment on the uh, um, Mara or Mascot Thunder. This is the uh, Germany uh, instrument, and uh, it will measure the surface condition. The TIR actually observed from, uh, basically from the sun side only, but global image is uh, taken. The Mara is on the surface and uh, observed during the day and night. So they are uh, com very complete, complete observations. And actually, Mara has uh, one band. Mara has uh, six band and six sensor, and each has a different sensor uh, filter. But uh, one filter has the uh, same as the uh, TI. The observation plan is something like that. The spacecraft is approaching to the the asteroid for the approach phase, and after that home position at the height of the 20 kilometer from the asteroid, basically from the sunlit direction. And this is, the home position is uh, most of the time uh, stay there. And touch them before touchdown or deployment of landers or rovers, then uh, is the descent to the surface. And at the mid altitude or low altitude, uh, observe the surface in more detail, and finally the touchdown phase is at uh, a very narrow and very uh, detailed surface observation, up to the centimeter per pixel size. But uh, there are some chances for the high phase angle observation to observe the bone side or dusk region. So it is uh, very uh, helpful for understanding the surface the number material. You know, the uh, temperature profile uh, is different for uh, uh, depending on the summer inertia. The summer inertia case is the temperature changes so high. Uh, the peak temperature is high. The higher temperature and uh, the summer in Asia, when the temperature is low, but uh, uh, peak time, uh, the time of the peak, 
the time delay for the time delay. So the temperature profile of the max and uh, maximum temperature and the delay time can be uh, very helpful to determine the surface thermal Actually, the image or the image from the one image, uh, the world uh, surface thermal inertia can be determined. And some uh, important regions we are tracking. Actually, we take the image five or ten minutes, every five or ten minutes. So the important uh, region can be tracked time to time. So detailed uh, stars be determined. Uh, this is a simple calculation of the 1999 J3 uh, during the arrival and departure. The hot region, uh, this is observed from the Earth's direction. That is the typical position of the spacecraft. And uh, if the, this is the cycle case, but uh, if the uh, summer energy is the uniform on, on the whole asteroid, the one image can, uh, theoretically, one image can uh, determine the star inertia if the uh, surface happiness or topographic anomalies, uh, anomalies absent. Um, then the uh, mod for the irregular uh, shaped uh, type case of the uh, uh, asteroid. Uh, this is the lower resolution uh, asteroid model. The thermal calculation and the uh, one direction and uh, transfer modeling case is uh, uh, something like that for each case. And recently, uh, a more detailed calculation is added with the two bit and the very high resolution shape modeling. Um, but that actually, it is a very preliminary case. So, that is the, the, it has the uh, function of the uh, one dimensional uh, heat transfer modeling. But in the calculation, the summary is assumed there, so no heat transfer into the star. So this is the example of the calculation of the grad student. Now, century the summer in 50 or 100 case is not in time today. So, this kind of calculation be a, a compared observation. So, uh, this is a summary. They have two and uh, summary experiments will be a, a plan. And the instrumentation is the uh, anchored barometer uh, based uh, imager, uh, originally uh, uh, commercial uh, thermography instrument. But it was uh, uh, applied to for space use, uh, covering the 150 to 440 degrees, and uh, we started the sum modeling in detail. Some of my modeling is uh, uh, constructed, and the uh, future observation will be considered. So the nominal vision plan is uh, considered. But uh, if you have uh, Interest, uh, anyone can uh, propose an idea for TIR data. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions for this? Yeah, I have a quick one. Your impact experiment, you mentioned that you're going to produce a crater. How big is the crater expected to be? Um, um, basically, the similar um, uh, crater uh, for the crater is the uh, we consider the very big crater is uh, possible to be uh, uh, such uh, as the um, maybe or something. Yeah, yeah. And so, how um, 
Yeah. How accurate is your landing? And how sure are you, will you be that you'll get it, the ejector bracket? Yeah, the ejector bracket is the, mm, uh, the impact experiment team uh, estimated the the credit is basically the two two meter or something like that, and the ejector is the ten meter or something like that. Um, maybe you said this and I, I missed it, but how will the orbit of the spacecraft be on the asteroid? I mean, for the thermal observations, will you get multiple times of day or will it be in a single time of day orbit? Um, basically, the spacecraft uh, is not orbiting, but the stay at the home position. Home position is about 20 kilometers southward. Us is the basically the same direction of the sun. So basically, the sun world, the uh, 20 kilometer mm -hmm. position. Okay, so that's a, that's the best. And uh, sometimes it changes the uh, uh, the angle. Will it change the angle kind of all the way from sun from terminator to terminate? Uh, but study. Uh, 40 degree to 40 degree. Okay. But it's a measure. Observe the, the dark and the uh, dawn area and dusk area. Mm -hmm. Great. Any more questions for the uh, for the speaker? Well, okay. Well, then let's uh, thank the speaker one last time and we can, we can change over. Thank you.